Good afternoon, everybody. This is Enrique of Spanish United. Um, tonight on our show, we're going to be having uh, Coco Nine, uh, who is a uh, civil activist and representative of the Rohingya people here in Los Angeles. So Coco, can you please introduce, your, introduce yourself to the audience, please? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Coco Nai. Thank you, Enrique, for inviting me to this podcast. I'm, I'm one of the founding members of the Los Angeles Rohingya Association, uh, which was formed in early 2012 in the light of the genocide going on in Burma. So we, Rohingya, decided to form this uh, small you know, organization to work collectively uh, for a human rights go uh, violation going on in Burma. So I myself have been living in the United States for the past 15 years. You know, I was living in the in Florida, West Palm Beach uh, for 10 years. Then I moved to California, Los Angeles area uh, back in 2010. So I, I have been here almost 10 years plus. So I'm currently, I'm working for Department of Rehabilitation as a case manager. Then on the site, I run the organization uh, Los Angeles Rohingya Association is a volunteer-run organization. So the purpose of this organization is we want to educate uh, the world about the genocide, what's going on. You know, unfortunately, you know, they keep on mentioning, uh, you know, never again, never again. But history certainly repeats itself. Whatever happened to the, you know, the Jewish community, you know, the Holocaust, it, unfortunately, it's happening right now in the middle of our eyes. So, it's, so that's the purpose here. I'm trying to educate the world that what's going on is in Burma is the repeat of the Holocaust. So thank you, Enrique, for allowing me to be on this podcast. Hey, it's my it's my pleasure. The whole the whole purpose of it is to incur is to encourage mutual exchange between the Hispanic community and other communities at, as at large so that we, we can uh, build a common a common cause. And if any if anyone is listening, um, Coco and I and, 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 and myself were part of the uh, panel of the uh, Taiwanese uh, association where they had uh, different speakers of different uh, community groups like the Taiwanese, the Hong Kongese, the Uyghurs, the Warringa, and, and myself representing the, the, the uh, Hispanic community within the uh, United States. And I, and I think it's very important to educate people on on dialogue because uh, when people are not educated about other people, people tend to go by um, by stereotypes, by um, superstitions at times and at, at many uh, circumstances, uh, they, they fear what they don't understand. And the whole purpose of Spanish United, my, my organization is that Hispanics, we come in different colors from all walks of life. But we, but, but we share one common the denominator, which is the Spanish language, identity, and culture. So one of the mottos that I have with a Spanish United is um, I, I promote unity with, within Hispanic groups. I promote culture over color. And to, at the same time, eliminate the, the tribalism within the Hispanic community, because the common stereotype that many people have is that Hispanics are one color or they're one one particular group and that's one of the things that I want to emphasize is that Hispanics we're not monolithic we we have many different um we come from different countries we speak different uh forms of Spanish and uh, we have different uh different customs but again what what unites us as a people is our identity as Hispanics our identity as Latinos our, our common language and our common culture. So that's one of the things that I want to do is to dispel any stereotypes that people may have have of Hispanic people. And at the same time to promote and to lobby for um, laws to be changed in our country with Hispanic people because Hispanics are the only minority group within America that don't have any minority protection. So we kind of fall out of um, the hate crimes protection laws. And I feel that it's very important that uh, Hispanics get protection because, you know, we are the largest minority within the country and, uh, you know, we deserve to have respect and recognition. The same thing, the same thing with your people, uh, Coco Nine, you know, I believe that mm -hmm. the Ringo people in Burma have been in Burma forever for centuries. It's the same thing, the same thing with the Chinese and uh, 
the ethnic Indians and then the Shan and the Mon and the other minority groups within the country, you know, I believe that you're doing a very commendable cause uh, advocating for your people. Great, yes, thank you. Um, you know, what's happening to the Rohingya, you know, it's more than a, you know, in general, it's, it's just a basically of a hatred. You know, it's how, how funny, not, I, I want to say funny, how, you know, ironic that human beings, you know, they tend to, you know, change their behavior. If, especially if someone look different from them, you know, it, whether it's Islamophobia or whether it's just, you speak a different language or- Hispanophobia. Culture, Hispanophobia. You know, Islamophobia. So all things. So I think it happened because of, you know, brainwashing. Because I believe that you know every human being can stand to have a mutual understanding. Like how you and me uh, today, you decided to invite me to this podcast because we want to engage in a dialogue to educate the world about diversity and you know what what is Hispanic community and what is the Rohingya community, which is a great platform. But unfortunately, you know, back in you know some countries like Burma, you know, people got brainwashed easily. You know what is going on. You know, is, is the, and also plus the the government, the, especially when the government is in dictatorship, they try to monopolize. You know, using the term, you know, Islamic. You know, they're calling, accusing the Muslim as a terrorist, and they're accusing. They just want to play the divide and conquer game. You know, which is dividing people and further and further. So instead of you know uniting everyone, uh, the government is involved in this, and along with extremists. Extremism is very is, is getting tough, you know. You know, not all like you know, Buddhism is a known as a peaceful religion. Right. Because I'm sure everyone knows Dalai Lama. He's one known as a peaceful preacher. You know, he's one of the Buddhist leader from Tibet. Right. Unfortunately, the majority of Burmese, not I wouldn't say majorities, uh, like like some Burmese, they got brainwashed. You know, they follow the extremist uh, Buddhism teaching. Mm -hmm. Believing that you know this is Buddhist first, you know, and uh, like nationalists, they misuse the nationalists. Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone has the right to love their country, but unfortunately, they're misusing you know nationalism in a wrong way. Right, right, and and the same thing that's happening here. Like I believe since Donald Trump became president, I feel that Hispanophobia has gotten worse, and one of the reasons why he became president was because of primarily because of immigration um, because the economy was very bad and a lot of Americans both white and black felt that they were left out of the economy and Hispanics both illegal and native born are growing rapidly and uh, I would say it has to do more with jobs job security and also with the fact that the demographic change in the United States is changing and a lot of people have a fear especially like the older establishment believe that if, if, if the current trend of, of demographics uh, doesn't uh, change, become stabilized, uh, they even, they even uh, mentioned that within the next couple of decades, America, the United States is gonna become a majority Hispanic country. And a lot of people have that, have that fear. So I believe that um, uh, the, the, the far right used that as a scapegoat to scapegoat all Hispanics as being bad people and, and I just saw uh, Hispanophobia got really bad. And um, it's just very scary because in California, you know, California is not perfect, but I will say California is one of the, the more tolerant states in the, in the country. It's like, it doesn't matter what you look like or what religion you follow, you know, you can fit in anywhere. But in many parts of the country, if you, if you don't fit into the white and black uh, narrative, you pretty much are on your own. And uh, I, I've seen many cases of many Hispanics that have, you know, been murdered, that have been killed, that have been harassed, that have been abused by many people, and um, you know that is something that I'm I'm trying to advocate for because um, you know Hispanics, you know, uh, the majority of Hispanics are honest, decent people that they just want to, you know, work, uh, look after their families. Yes, there is a small segment of Hispanics, you know, like with any group of people that do bad things, but it's not everybody. And that's one of the things that my organization does is not only to help on the issue of Hispanic rights, but also to present a more positive image that not all Hispanics are uh, in, in gangs or dealing drugs or taking advantage of the system, because that's the condition that people have been conditioned in the last couple of years with the previous administration 
is uh, his hispanophobia that you know that we're not good that we're not good people and that we're not contributing to the country so i think that is something that i am trying to uh change with my foundation also i wanted to mention uh, i know that there was a uh a buddhist monk well known in burma i forgot what his name was but he appeared on a cover of time magazine which was called the face of terror and he was considered like the the uh the uh, buddhist the the buddhist fundamentalist version of of the buddhists and he was promoting a lot of uh not not only ethnic uh hatred towards rohingya people and, and towards muslims but also uh he was trying to do like an ethnic cleansing of of the of the country by promoting that the rohingya and the muslims that live in in burma were not born in the country but they were like immigrants like from bangladesh or from somewhere else so I, I'm I'm very aware of the of the situation of uh, what's going on there in Burma, and I think and I think that the dictatorship of Burma, along with this particular Buddhist uh, monk that is very well known over there, uh, they work they're working together to try to ethnically cleanse anyone that's not even a native Bur Burmese, not necessarily has to do with with Rohingya people, because that's what's been going on for the last 40, 50 years in the country. And am I correct, Coco? Yes, definitely you are correct because you know Buddhism, like I mentioned earlier on, Buddhism is known to be a peaceful. You know they preach for you know peacefulness. You know you know unfortunately, what's happening in Burma is also because like you mentioned, people got scared. You know like they are afraid of you know Muslim going to take over you know Burma. You know but the funny thing is, Muslim has been part of Burma you know, for more than decades, you know, more than 100 years, you know, the part of the Western state where Rohingya indigenous from, it was a separate independent kingdom, you know, before the British came and, you know, British came, colony came and divide everything. So Muslim has been living side by side with Buddhists, you know, all the ethnic Buddhists and also ethnic Christians, so many, they've been living side by side in peace and harmony until uh, the military government came and, you know, preach for you know like brainwashing the public in the name of buddhism saying that you know if if we're going to let the minorities take over some days they're going to you know conquer and same thing similar like what you mentioned about hispanic phobia you know they are afraid that hispanic is going to become a majority and taking them but you know like you know i really appreciate the hispanic community they really contribute to the american economy you know they are one of the largest consumption and then they contribute a lot economically jobs and also consumer goods so many things they have changed the way america economy the dy dynamic because if you look at the neighboring country uh, we have mexico close by us uh, you know and also other latin america country you know right now what's going on in cuba is also mm -hmm. another thing you know that i'm also very deeply concerned because Cuba also is a dictator country, you know, that we really, we, we stand, we know what's going on, what is like to be in, in the dictatorship, because the same military government has been doing that, doing that to Burma. Uh, they have been in power, you know, and they've been in the name of democracy, they try to lie to the world that they're giving democracy. So they are applying the same somewhat communism and somewhat dictatorship principle. So, and you know, they also have a support from China, CCP, that's another one. I, I want to touch on that is geopolitics. You know, geopolitics right. is very important. You know, that, you know, whatever country they support, you know, they will go. So that's why, you know, Burma have the guts to, you know, have the dictator, you know, and they have guts to kill the minorities. Because today we have the Chinese government, CCP, supporting them openly, you know. Mm -hmm. And they, when U.S. try to intervene, it's going to be very conflict. And plus the United States is kind of like isolated, it's far away geographically. Mm -hmm. They can influence by economic sanction, which the US did, which is a good thing. You know, we really appreciate the US Congress for doing the arm embargo and also sanction. So sanction work, you know, is work because the military government, they won't have access to, you know, economic, their bank. As a matter of fact, the, the US Federal Reserve and the US uh, Department of Treasury, they confiscated you know, they intercepted $1 billion belonging to the Burmese military regime that was stuck here, you know, in, in the U.S. bank, you know. So they right now the, the money is all un confiscated under, under the eye of the U.S. government. So in the future, if uh, Myanmar is, Burma is fully democracy, 
the money will go back to the, the regular public funds, which used which can be used to develop Burma. Because right now, I you know it's good that the money is in the U.S. Treasury. They already sanctioned the money because the the military tried to withdraw the money, but thank God the U.S. Congress they caught it and they they confiscate the money. Currently, the money money is with the U.S. Uh, Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is happening in Puerto Rico. Even though Puerto Rico is a is a U.S. territory, uh, Puerto Rico has been withheld from many funds, especially during Hurricane. Uh, Maria and the Puerto Rican people are suffering a lot. And also a lot of people are not aware about is the Jones Act, which is a, a bill, a law that was passed in 1917 that gave Puerto Ricans US citizenship, but, but it, it took away a lot of the autonomy that Puerto Rico had because during the Spanish-American War, uh, Spain had to see Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Guam, Mariana Islands to, to, the, uh, to the United States and plus I don't know, like 20, 40 million in compensation for the war. And uh, Puerto, Puerto Rico, along with Guam and the Miranda Islands were the only territories that chose to stay with, with the United States while Cuba and the Philippines became independent. But uh, Puerto Rico has not had the same equality with the United States. Even, even though we're part of the United States, we're not a state. So we are un, unincorporated. So a lot of laws that we have in America don't apply in Puerto Rico. Like for example, Puerto Rico cannot freely trade with countries that that um, that America does not approve of. Meaning that let's say for 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 example, if if Puerto Rico wants to buy bananas from Dominican Republic, which is the neighboring country to Puerto Rico, uh, they have to ask permission from Washington in order to do trade with Dominican Republic, meaning that uh, if they do trade with Dominican Republic, the bananas have to go to port in Miami first, and then from Miami goes to Puerto Rico, and then it makes it very, very, very expensive. So uh, taxes are, are very high in Puerto Rico when it comes to imports. Everything has to be imported. Uh, the, uh, the minimum wage is very low. It's, it's like, it's like 725, which is the federal minimum wage law. But with the high cost of living, people cannot afford to, to live in Puerto Rico. So what's happening is that many Puerto Ricans are being forced to leave the island to come to the United States. And then you have a lot of wealthy Americans that are coming to Puerto Rico that are taking advantage of the tax laws that allow them to live in Puerto Rico tax-free, meaning that they could claim on paper that they are living in Puerto Rico while they're living in, let's say, Alabama or Los Angeles or New York City or Alaska. So they don't they don't have to pay to pay taxes. But what's going on is that, you know, Puerto Rico is becoming segregated. It's like you have a very wealthy class of, um, of Americans that are predominantly Caucasian that are taking all the best land, all the best uh, property, housing and resources. And while the Puerto Ricans are regular people, are being forced to, to move out of their own neighborhoods and having to live in segregated areas. And I feel that if they don't, if they don't remove uh, those, those unequal laws, that Puerto Rico might become another Chetnia. And if, if you have read about Puerto Rico's history, Puerto Rico has fought the United States government many times for, for independence, but the United States government has always like shut it down. Even though Puerto Rico has been able to like, um, have the free state status, but they don't have the same level of equality with with Washington and as they would if they were if they were um, a state. So uh, in many in many in many in many ways, Puerto Rico is it's like it's like a colony, but at, but at the, but at the same time, uh, they don't really share the same benefits as. Uh, as uh, as Americans do in the mainland, and Puerto Ricans sadly are treated as as uh, immigrants. Most people in America don't even know that Puerto Ricans are part are part of the United States or they're, that they're even uh, citizens. They see them as another immigrant group. So that's another thing that that I also emphasize is that Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens by birth, regardless if they are born on the island or born uh, in the mainland. And they have the same uh, rights as any as a, as any American-born citizen. 
Yes, it's uh, an unfortunate is what was going on with the Puerto Ricans. I heard about Puerto Rico when I first, you know, in college, I took some historical history, U.S. history class. They did mention briefly, but however, they did not really explain in detail what is Puerto Rico. I always thought Puerto Rico was, a, you know, like a, you know, like a state then until, you know, one of my friends told me, nope, it's a, like a territory, like what you mentioned, like Guam and Northern Marine Islands. So the U.S. have a special agreement or some, something like that. So it's unfortunate that you know some wealthy Americans are they are taking advantage, uh, you know, of going to Puerto Rico and there's a loopholes. Certainly, uh, you know, we we need, we need to fix the loophole. You know, there is a way. So like you are doing a good job, you know, educating the world, having this organization, the Congress. Maybe if Puerto Rico have a fair representative, there will be better. Same thing. What's going on with the Rohingya? You know, unfortunately, Congress. You know, they acknowledge that genocide is going on there, but they, they did not, you know, do further. They just, you know, giving lip service, you know, oh, we're going to sanction Burma, we're going to do this, but there's no strong action. Because, you know, the genocide is going on in Burma has been going on for more than decades. What the Rohingya people, we need a peacekeeping force to ensure that Rohingya currently, Bangladesh hosts the largest refugee in the world, about more than a 1 million refugees, 1.2 million refugees, close to 1.2 million are stuck in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is one of the world's poorest country. We really cannot depend on the, the only reason why Rohingya went there because there was a neighboring country from Western right. Burma and many of them flee there. And we have to swim there. Some of them drown along the way. Some of them, they take a, like a small boat or small, you know, kayaking or whatever it takes to get there. They managed to reach the Bangladesh and Unfortunately, you know, this is a geopolitics and the U.S. leading the world, you know, in terms of democracy, they're promoting democracy. They have to set an example, you know, of, you know, warning Burma, not just by giving sanction, maybe resolving the issue, you know, providing resources, you know, if we get some basic resources, uh, Rohingya community, we can stand on, on our own. We don't really need the, the Burmese government or Burmese because the fact that uh, majority of Rohingya people, they survive by fishing, farming, agriculture. That's a big thing in Western part of Burma. So we, we, they don't even really need, you know, outside funds that much as long as they have access to, access to those rich natural resources. Another reason why uh, Rohingya people were genocide in Arkan state, like I mentioned, you know, they were Arkan state, which is the indigenous land of the Rohingya. They were blessed uh, with, you know, ocean, and also agricultural land, and also a lot of minerals, a lot of oil too, like, you know, resources, oil and that stuff. That's the reason why uh, Rohingya people, and it's, and it's ironically, it's still one of the poorest states in Burma because the Burmese government, they are corrupted. They take the money and they put it in the pocket. But Rakhine state could be one of the richest state in Burma. And the Rohingya, you know, they did not even ask for any handout any you know, welfare system from the Burmese government until they commit the genocide. They want to kick them out there. So, you know, the Rohingya people can stand on their own because especially when they have access to agricultural land, you know, fishing. So that's all human, and that just, just like how thousand, thousand years ago, how the Native Americans survived before the, you know, the white colonism came and right. conquered uh, the U.S. You know, they didn't survive. So that's what the Rohingya did. And unfortunately, Burmese government, you know, kicked them out, you know, kill all of them, try to wipe them out and they have to flee to Bangladesh. And today, they are living. They are living in a desperate situation, you know. So it's very unfortunate. Mm. You know, I so I, I, so I was going to ask you how how would you say um, the relationship between Rohingya and, and Hispanics in America is? Do you know of any type of uh, exchange or dialogue between both groups prior to Spanish United contacting? Yes, I heard in some states. Uh, for example, you know, from my knowledge. In Chicago and Texas, there had been some, you know, mutual understanding between the Latino Hispanic community in Chicago, where they they did the outreach for, you know, citizenship, and then the nonprofit organization over there they also outreach to the Rohingya community because of the language barrier. So that organization is helping to provide the resources. Since uh, those uh, Hispanic group has been very united, they have been well established in all the U.S majority states uh, like, you know, minority state, like New York City, uh, like Chicago. I have seen some, you know, Latino nonprofit organization, 
they include the Rohingya community in the outreach campaign, whether it's for citizenship, you know, outreach or for even for health clinic. So they're including vulnerable community. I heard from my counterparts in Chicago, that's what they tell me because Chicago also, there's a lot of a huge Hispanic community too, Latino community. Yes. There's also a, a large, there's more Rohingya in Chicago than here. Uh, one, one of the reason is because of the, the, you know, the US government agreement to bring them to those Midwest because the cost of living there is a little bit cheaper. Right. Maybe, maybe in Wisconsin and Chicago, uh, that's why not all of them can, uh, they, they can come to California because of California, they lack uh, entry level jobs. Right. So I've seen those, um, you know, the Hispanic community are standing united with the Rohingya community. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome because I, I, I just, I just feel that uh, uh, Hispanics uh, need to work with other groups because you know it's not just only uh, Hispanophobia coming from the white and the black community, but there is Hispanophobia coming like from other Asian uh, groups as well. So I feel that it's very important that the Hispanic community. Uh, has uh, has has a mutual exchange with other Asian groups, so that way any type of uh, future tensions can be can be cooled out. Because both groups, both Asians and Hispanics, are are growing in large numbers. And you know, I do I do have a concern that if uh, Hispanics don't economically become uh, at the same level as Asians are, that there could be possible tension in the future. So I feel that it's very important that. Uh, uh, Hispanics uh, reach out to the Asian community and also the Asian community reach out to the Hispanic community because like, you know, like it or not, uh, both groups, both, both mutually depend on each other. Like, for example, if you go to the San Gabriel area, that's predominantly Chinese, but a lot of people that work like in the grocery stores or whatever are uh, Hispanic. And I believe that, um, if the Chinese community, for example, were to invest in Hispanic areas and, and bring uh, prosperity to Hispanic areas like I've seen in the San Gabriel Valley of Arcadia, Temple City, Alhambra, Monterey Park, et cetera, that, uh, that, will, that will keep uh, both groups um, at peace and at, and at the same time will dispel any type of mistrust or or prejudice that they may have towards one another. Yes, uh, definitely, I agree. Diversity is very important, especially you know when um, the Asian American and also the Hispanic, both of them are minority groups. You know, both of them also suffer so many injustice. You know, going on uh, where where I back in the days, you know, the Japanese was sent to the concentration camp, right in the heart of San Gabriel Valley. I heard that yes. history to, and also the Chinese were one time banned from coming to the US, you know, when the Chinese American, they contribute. Same thing also with the His Hispanic community, you know, whether it's, you know, Puerto Rican or Mexican American, so they also have suffered as, as a matter of fact, Mexican American at one point, they were originally, you know, I heard history like the original citizens of California, because California, that was very, you know, controversial, like, California was once part of Mexico. Yes. And they took at one point native, you know, Californians that are of Hispanic descent. They were living here for so many, so many, have so many generations. They were also deported to Mexico because of politics difference. And this is, I heard from some of the Mexican American activists known as Chicano activists. They yes. told me that, you know, even though they don't speak a single word or Spanish, they, they were born in California, born in Los Angeles, born and raised here. They have a strong roots here, culture, everything. And some of their family generation got deported back to Mexico. And right. I, I heard of, that was right. unfortunate. And the same, and the same thing with uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. They were all part of the Spanish Empire when Mexico became independent. It became part of the Mexican Empire. But during the Mexican American War, America took away those territories. Same thing with Florida. Florida was part of Spain. But in the case of in the case of Florida, they they purchased it from from the from the Spanish. Okay, interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. Ja history can teach uh, can taught us a lot of stuff going on, but also history has also taught us a lot of injustice going on. So whenever I see injustice, you know, I like to stand in solidarity, uh, whether it's you know in the Los Angeles 
or in internationally, you know, what, what is happening to the Palestinian, what happening to different country. You know, I really like, I'm against injustice. You know, that's a we Rohingya community. We know how does it feel to lose your own homeland, especially since young, you know, I cannot, you know, I cannot really identify, you know, my strong Rohingya culture because the Burmese government took away our culture. That's why we're trying to rebuild our culture in globally in, in the US or some of us, you know, that are fortunate to come here, we're able to identify as a Rohingya, but some countries, the Rohingya have no choice. They're living in like countries like Malaysia, they are treated, you know, like a third class, you know, people, you know, they are not even respected. Because, you know, I don't blame some of the Asian countries because they also have job security and they're right. not really developed or rich like US or the Western country, but still they also should have some kind of decent uh, dignity or human being to respect one human being. So in those countries, you know, Rohingya people are suffering. They cannot even call themselves Rohingya. If they are out there, the police might catch them and, you know, they might deport them or they might put them in the jail. So right, you know, very right. sorry things going on. In the yeah, that, yeah, that is something that happens with a lot of stateless um, people around, around the world. That's most unfortunate. Um, I wanted to tell you, Coco, thank you very much for uh, being on the uh, on the show. I truly appreciate it. And uh, we, we will definitely keep in touch. And as soon as I'm done with the podcast, I will send you the uh, the link. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me again. Not a problem, Coco. Have yourself a wonderful day and happy eat. Thank you. Have a great take weekend. Care. And take care. You too. Bye bye.